I'm John Travis in Novato, California on the 25th of September, 2020, talking to Neil Nathan in Fort Bragg up in Mendocino County, just a couple hours north of here. We've not met, but we have a lot of friends in common. You were just talking about Bill Manahan and Norm Sheely and the old gang. Uh, I um, started out back in the 70s and um, knew a lot of you folks that were doing medicine, but since I left the practice of sick care, my path diverged. So I've had to keep up along the way and I'm, I missed meeting you. So I'm delighted to get to know you. And uh, I'd like to start with where you uh, uh, were born, what, um, um, influences, parents, siblings, early childhood experiences that led you first into medicine and then into the type of medicine that you're into. So let's start at the beginning. Okay. Um, well, I was born in um, Brooklyn, New York. Um, um, uh, my parents being the uh, typical uh, Jewish um, parents that they were, always instilled in me the um, desire to go into medicine and to be a doctor. My son, the doctor. <laughs> yeah, basically. And my brother uh, also. So they actually have two sons, the doctors. Um, but fortunately for me, that really was my path. So that um, I, I was, del I'm very happy that they pushed me in that direction because that really fit with what I wanted to do with my life. And I'm really happy to still be practicing and still be um, able to be of service to people. Um, but we started out in that environment, um, highly academic, highly competitive. Um, are you the oldest or are you brother? I'm, I'm the oldest of, a, of the two of us. Um, um, over the years, I, I had an uncle who, uh, ran the biochemistry lab at Roosevelt Hospital in New York. And by, by the time I was 12 or 13, I was going to his laboratory every weekend to work there in the clinical laboratory. And that kind of continued, although I was really quite young. I then went to work with Rob, uh, uh, Arthur Rosenthal at the Long Island Jewish Hospital, in which I started out as a glassware washer and slowly worked up to actually working in the clinical and research biochemistry labs there. Mm -hmm. um, so I was originally kind of research oriented, which sort of informed my choice of medical school. I went to the University of Chicago. Um, but while I was at Long Island Jewish Hospital, I was given the opportunity to number one, become a blood drawer for the hospital. And then I was given the opportunity to work as a, um, an extern there, an orderly in the emergency room. So I would spend my summers, even when I was young, um, literally um, doing both research and clinical medicine. And I, I realized over time that I really preferred actual practice. I really like working with people. Mm. Now, uh, going back to your family of origin a little more, uh, what did your dad do uh, and your mom? Uh, my, say, dad, my dad was an industrial arts teacher. My mom was a school secretary. Mm -hmm. um, kind of ordinary people living their lives. And how was uh, school for you, like grade school and high school? Were you a jock or a... a um, I, I was a decent athlete, but... I skipped a whole bunch of grades because I did very, very well in school. Um, so that I was always a couple of years behind my grade. Um, so although I participated in athletics, I was always too young and too small to make the team. Never really dated because back in those days, no one wanted to go out with someone who was two years younger than they. Mm. They, they were always looking for someone older. It wasn't until I actually got older that that evolved. Mm -hmm. So then uh, college, where? Queens College, New York City. Uh -huh. And then what led you to Chicago? Um, it was out of New York, and they offered me a full scholarship. Oh. <laughs> two good reasons. Well, I, I've often heard that there are two types of New Yorkers, the ones that stay and the ones that leave. <laughs> uh, I was clearly in the latter category. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's how I feel about Ohio. It's a good place to be from. 
And <clears throat> so then uh, in med school, uh, anything outstanding uh, interests or you've already got a lot of clinical and research experience did that no I actually um, in my senior year of college being as young as I was I kind of shifted my work to the theater where I I did almost all of my senior year in theater work um, writing plays directing them acting in plays and and one of the things that got me to survive medical school was number one, playing on our intramural basketball team, and number two, um, acting in a lot of plays. So um, I just found medical school not what I thought it would be. Um, I, I kind of went into medicine wanting to be a healer, and I was kind of put off by what I was being trained to be was a medical technician. And, yeah, that's a little bit pharma. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. So it allowed me to keep pieces of myself going so that when I got out of my training, um, I was closer to being me and could evolve my career, I don't know, in my own way. I, I didn't think of it at the time as being courageous. I just thought it was necessary. Yeah. And in those days, we were doing internships, probably. Yep. Uh, I entered, interned at San Francisco General Hospital, yeah. and um, then I went into the Indian Health Service, where I worked in um, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and Alaska. Uh huh. So you were in PHS then? I was. Yeah, I, I, I did the same thing, uh, only I was in the hospital system, in my residency. But, uh, and uh, residency was also at UCSF? Never took a residency. I grandfathered into family practice. Oh. Um, I, I, at those days, it was early enough in medical care that there weren't a lot of residencies. So oh. I was able to grandfather in by taking my family practice boards. Oh. And so I stayed certified in family practice for 35 years. Okay. And then after uh, PHS, what uh, what'd you do? Well, when I left the public health service, I went to Mendocino, California, where I started a, a family practice. Um, what year was that? 1974. Oh, wow. And I met up with several people who were creating what they were calling a pain clinic. It was one of the first pain clinics in the country. And we were, um, we had a surgeon, myself, a chiropractor and a massage therapist as our core group. Later added several other physicians, acupuncturists, psychics, um, um, acupuncturists, um, every type of alternative treatment you can imagine. Um, in the course of about two years, with a focus on working on ourselves, sharing what we knew with others, and having weekly staff meetings where we would discuss our problem patients and try to figure out which of our skills would be appropriate for which patients. All of this in Mendocino? Yeah. Wow, I had no idea. I was in Mill Valley in 75 and developing my center where we similarly had client meetings, uh, you know, where we try to figure out what was going on. <laughs> Right. It was called the McCornack Center for the Healing, Healing Arts because it was held in an old home that is a historic home there called the McCornack House. Um, it still exists, but not by that name. And how did, uh, you know, how did this evolve? Who, whose idea was it? And, uh, well, it was evolving when I arrived in Mendocino and the group invited me to join them immediately. Uh -huh. And I did. Um, and its evolution taught me a lot. Um, we were all in agreement about our philosophy and what we wanted it to be. But we actually grew so quickly to about 20, 21 members that um, some of the founding members found ourselves outvoted after a year and a half about what it was and what it should be, and our vision of personal growth, 
working on each other, sharing our skills, kind of disappeared into, this is just a place we want to work from. Mm -hmm. And so they literally voted three of the four of us out of the group after a couple of years. I, I being one. Uh -huh. So then what happened uh, or what did you do next? I stayed in the area and I had a full practice by then. And so I continued to practice in the area. I was um, head of the emergency room in Fort Bragg and I delivered babies, did a little bit of surgery. I did a full family practice. But at this point in my life, I was still interested in healing. So I was studying voraciously with anyone who had something to teach me. So the chiropractor became one of my best friends and he taught me uh, some things about manipulation. Um, he then encouraged me to learn about Reikian therapy, which he was studying um, with a fellow named Phil Kokoruto in the city. And we would go down there every two weeks for training sessions and work on each other. Um, I began to use emotional release work with my patients. I had learned hypnosis in medical school, was using that as a tool as well. That's we, unusual in medical school? They, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I, I, <laughs> understand that the fellow who taught us hypnosis was let go of the next year, but ma I managed to get a year of training before he was let go. Uh, University of Chicago was not very enlightened at that point. Um, the person who taught me most was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on oh, factory yeah. there. And she had a weekly teaching session in which she would interview patients and live, we would all sit behind a two-way mirror, crammed into a little teeny booth behind the mirror, watching how she talked to patients and how she elicited information. She was phenomenal, by the way. And I learned more from her than anyone else in medical school. Um, yeah. by ob observing her compassion, caring. And when people would feel her compassion, they would share things on a deeper level than many of the people that I heard in medical school, in which patients would just give them bare facts. And right. I, I realized how important a good history was. Um, I realized how important it was to connect with someone on a deep level, if you're gonna get any meaningful information from them. And for that, I'm uh, eternally grateful to her. Oh, that's great. Uh, I got to spend a day with her once in DC, but uh, she was amazing. And you know, I believe that the currency of wellness is connection and there it is. And you can't do that in a 15 minute assembly line with uh, pill pushing. <laughs> no, no, can't do that. <laughs> So, I was, so to come back to my narrative, kind of, I studied acupuncture with an acupuncturist in our office. Um, um, I then moved into, um, at the urging of my chiropractic friends, they urged me to get training in um, osteopathic cranial work, which I did back in 75. Um, and so I was growing exponentially, if you will, my vision of what medical practice was uh, had shifted entirely to the full spectrum of mind-body. Mm -hmm. So I was already kind of doing holistic medicine before it was a word. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, back in the early 70s, uh, uh, what kind of hippie influence did, were you at Woodstock or, you know, uh, uh, well, if you looked at pictures of me in those days, I had a full beard. I thought it was well-kempt, but it was straggly when I look at photos of it. And I went, mm, I can see why people thought I was a hippie. Um, and although, um, as did many of my community, I had experiences with uh, marijuana and psychedelic drugs, which I found very helpful as well. Um, um, I really wasn't a hippie. Um, I was working 90 hours a week, um, uh, trying to build my home from a little barn that was not yet finished to actually create a home out of it. So I didn't have time to be a hippie. Um, <laughs> um, and never have, to be honest with you. I, I, 
uh, healing was my passion. I ate it, drank it. I mm. went anywhere that I heard of somebody doing something interesting. Um, I would go to workshops and um, I spent everything I made on learning, basically. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you mentioned that you worked with Norm Sheely. When did that come in? Uh, well, I, I first met Norm <clears throat> in um, 1979 at one of the first AHMA meetings in La Crosse. Mm -hmm. Since I was living in Duluth, Minnesota at the time, it wasn't that far for me. Mm -hmm. And Norm and I struck up a friendship so that I would actually come down and help him run his clinic when he needed to go away for a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, so I, was very, I got pretty involved with treating chronic pain early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was at the uh, founding meeting in Denver in 78, but I didn't make it to La Crosse the next year. And I think the third meeting was in San Francisco at San Francisco University. And then I, I couldn't afford the dues, so I had to drop out. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, uh, you, you met Norm there and uh, uh, you were practicing in Duluth, did you say? Right, right. By then I had shifted. Okay, we jumped ship here. Um, so I practiced in Mendocino for about five years, and um, I was actually getting very um, put off by the drug culture. Um, it was too much marijuana being used. My daughter was being brought up with too much of that as an influence. I, I wanted to move to an area in which I thought there would be better influences on her. So I took a job working for the University of Minnesota um, as actually I'm head of the Department of Family Practice for the medical school in Duluth, which was a two-year medical school. And I, I was, became the assistant director of the family practice residency program there. A two-year medical school, the last two years or? I, I first two years, first two years. I've never um, heard of that. Uh, well, there were several at the time. I don't know if there are any anymore I think that one may still exist, but it was a feeding school for the main campus for the University of Minnesota. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. But it's a huge jump from Mendocino to Duluth, <laughs> yeah. like winter, I gather. Yes, it was. Well, I had grown up in New York and sh Chicago. Winter wasn't yeah. as big a deal back then. Um, so, so how long were you there? 11 years. Uh -huh. And then what, uh, what was the next chapter? Well, um, I, I actually taught in this context, I taught the first elective course in holistic medicine at the medical school for the full 11 years. I think it was one of the first courses being offered in the country. Um, and actually quite a few of my students went on to go into a holistic medicine type career, which was really quite gratifying. Um, but I, I left Duluth um, to go to, um, going to get my context here, Hawaii. Oh, um, wow. I was offered a position in um, uh, Konakakai on the, on the island of um, uh, Molokai. Oh. And the job was, to me, interesting. I was supposed to they had just passed the Native Hawaiian Health Care Act, and they were wanting to integrate kahuna medicine into the little hospital that they have in Kanakakai, about a 25-bed hospital nursing home. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, I thought this is an opportunity to study another type of healing medicine. And I um, took the job, discovered that the hospital was e eager to do this, but the actual um, native population of Molokakai was, wasn't as interested. So that they, they well, no, they were just content to have me do the work, but there was no, in other words, it was running on my energy. Mm -hmm. And for something to succeed, there has to be more than that. There has to be an interest in the part of the community that this happened. So they were okay to get my services. They just didn't want to participate in any meaningful way, um, which was kind of an interesting wake-up call to me that it was a reminder that if you take a job 
be sure to ask if someone actually wants you to do that. <laughs> now, had so, you had any uh, familiarity with Kahuna medicine prior to that? Or? I had some, in, some familiarity with native medicine. I worked in the Indian Health Service for a few years. I, I met native healers, medicine men. I had some contact with them. Um, but Kahuna medicine was different. And in point of fact, the elders who were getting into their 90s were under strict orders from their children not to share what they knew with Haoles or Caucasians. Mm -hmm. And however, their children were not interested in the long apprenticeship required to gain those skills. And so I was looking at a whole type of healing about to become obsolete while I was watching. And in point of fact, that's pretty much happened. Mm. It's interesting watching a whole healing system mm. um, disappear <clears throat> before your eyes for um, uh, curious reasons. Mm. Interesting. Well, we certainly did a number on Hawaii, didn't we? We did. Um, Starting with Captain Cook. We, we did, but you know, it, it's interesting to watch a culture not embrace their heritage mm -hmm. and get caught up in Western thoughts. You know, I want um, the latest iPod and cars and I want things rather than the older culture, which had a lot more to show for it. And that's not an unusual event in my experience in the world. It's very common, yeah. It, uh, uh, I, and I realize we, we missed some slots back there when you're in PHS. You mentioned you were in three different locations, Alaska, North Dakota, and... Uh, uh, South Dakota and, and uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. What uh, reservations and what were you doing there? Well, I was on an open reservation in South Dakota, and I was doing family practice specializing in eye work. Um, the, I, I transferred to Oklahoma where, where I worked in Pawnee, again, an open reservation. And then I went to um, Anchorage where I worked at the uh, Anchorage Native Hospital there, um, both working in the family practice department and literally flying all over the state doing clinics in very tiny communities. Mm -hmm. So what did you pick up there from native medicine and how did that influence you? Well, the closest I came to native medicine was in South Dakota in which there were actually medicine men who would come to see me at the clinic and we would have long talks about what they did or how they did it. And um, I, I, I read whatever I could at that point. Um, they were fairly open to me. Mm -hmm. um, not fully open because you really have to be there for a long time yeah. for a native population to fully accept you as a Caucasian. Um, but they were moderately accepting of me. I, my wife and I were invited to powwows where we would be the only Caucasians present. Mm -hmm. um, again, I was still a basketball um, a player passionately, and I chose to play on the Indian team rather than on the white team. Um, I, it was, I, they were more fun. <laughs> but I also wanted to, uh, to go back socially. Uh, you've, you've mentioned a wife and daughter, but where and when did they come in and uh, any other kids? And Well, I got married to my first wife in, in medical school, my senior year. Um, our daughter was born in Alaska, um, then had two sons after which both of whom were born in Duluth, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And so uh, first wife implies that maybe there was another one? My, I divorced my first wife after about 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, after we were divorced, I, I met the love of my life, who I've been with for 30 years. And... Um, I'm happily, happily married now. Good for you. It took me to age 68 to find mine with three previous relationships. We've had 10 years together. Good, but you know what matters is the quality. And um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm totally blessed 
with oh, wonderful relationships. Great. And so uh, your daughter and sons, are they, you probably got grandkids now? And are I do, I do. Um, so um, my, my daughter and my oldest son actually live together in the same home in San Diego. Um, uh, um, she's a, a, a housewife, which is all she wanted to be. Um, we have two grandchildren from that relationship. Uh, my son is a Waldorf teacher, and uh, uh, he has a daughter, so that's my third grandchild. And I have one other son. Um, my younger son is living in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Well, that fills us in on your social scene. Uh, let's go back to um, your, uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, um, well, I don't know. Was it Hawaii? Uh, okay, I'm uh, now in Hawaii. You're just getting the the cliff the cliff note version of my travels. Um, it was uh, it was obvious within a year and a half of being in there that this wasn't going anywhere. So I was then invited to run the Virginia Livingston Clinic in San Diego. Uh, Virginia Livingston, who you might have known, um, uh, had developed a vaccine for cancer and autoimmune illness. And she had recently died, and I needed someone to take over her work at the clinic in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So I went down there um, with my family, ran that clinic for about five years. Um, and then, actually, at the invitation of Dr. Sheely, I went to run his clinic in Springfield, Missouri. Um, Norm, and I, Norm and I had spent... Uh, had kept in good close contact over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I had been a, I don't, hadn't mentioned it, but I had evolved my skills in pain management. When I was in Duluth, uh, not only was I teaching, but I also ran the, um, the, the a hospital-based pain clinic for my stay in Duluth. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a full wing or, of a hospital and we had a lot of patients. And I used my various skills in um, osteopathic manipulation, acupuncture, injections, um, my, my psychological background and knowledge to really help people with chronic pain. So uh, Norm asked me to come uh, be the medical director for his clinic, and um, we were happy to do that. Interesting. Uh, back with the Virginia Livingston, the, uh, I hadn't heard of this vaccine. What was that about? And... Uh, Dr. Livingston developed an autogenous vaccine where out of a patient's urine and stool, she would grow a bacteria that she thought was the cause of all cancer. And she would isolate the bacteria. And then in the same way that you would make a DPT vaccine, she would kill the, uh, the bacteria and filter it, making it into a vaccine so that it was immunogenic. Mm -hmm. And she found, she, she did it, many years of work with mice and other um, laboratory animals proving how well it worked. And then was asked to start working with people and found that her vaccine actually worked quite well. So she was getting some cures of cancer and autoimmune illness that other people uh, were not achieving at the time. In fact, 1992, the New England Journal of Medicine um, wrote an article in which they went into the clinic and compared clinic results with the University of Pennsylvania Oncology Clinic and found that they had virtually identical outcomes but the quality of life of patients who got the vaccine was infinitely better than those people who had routine oncological treatment. Yeah, I imagine. It's interesting. I, I missed this completely. Uh, I, the name is dimly familiar, but I, I can't believe they didn't shut them down with uh, pharma would not uh, tolerate something like that. It, um, it, uh, we were investigated a number of times and no one could could fault our results, actually. Um, they paid attention to data. Yes. Um, and the clinic continued on, for a number of years after I left. 
uh, but eventually it just wasn't paying for itself and it had to close down. No, I'm surprised that it uh, would not, uh, if it was that on target, that it wouldn't have developed further. Hmm. And now, uh, let's see, we're back. Uh, we've uh, done Hawaii and uh, Norms. Uh, how long were you in Springfield? Four years? Well, I spent four years running Norm's clinic as his medical director. And then I went out on my own. I just decided that I was ready to create my own little clinic. Um, so I spent another uh, 10 years in Springfield, just building up my, home, my own little holistic center. It's a small clinic in a little hospital and we had a lot of fun. I was there in the summer of 83, I think it was. He had a conference. I remember uh, the, uh, a musician I met, a um, keyboardist, uh, that uh, I loved her music. Uh, I don't know, were you there then in uh, early 80s? I, I was not. I didn't get to Springfield till 95. Oh, okay. So we didn't cross paths there. No. So Springfield for another 10 years and Somehow you're, you're back in Mendocino, but any other steps in between? One more step. Um, eventually, um, we, we just felt that Missouri wasn't the right place for us. And we wanted to go to a community where we could eventually retire and really wanted to live. And the place that we had kept coming back to, my wife and I both, was Mendocino. Mm -hmm. And so after years of looking all over the country, where do we want to live? We just kind of did a, well, where do we go three or four times a year? We go, we go to Mendocino. So um, that became a no-brainer. We, um, I was offered a job in a large clinic. You might know it, actually. Uh, Gordon Medical Associates, um, Eric Gordon's clinic in Santa Rosa. Um, Eric had been an old friend of mine and offered me a job there. So um, we moved to Fort Bragg, and I would commute to Santa Rosa several days a week to um, see patients in a very comprehensive way. No, I'm, I'm not familiar with that clinic, but uh, I've been in and out of California and Australia, Costa Rica, other places too. So now somewhere along the line, you got interested in molds and uh, all those good things. How, how did that unfold? Well, I probably have to back up on that story, which was when I was working um, as a pain specialist in Minnesota, Back in the early 80s, we began to see a strange creature which we called fibrositis that we now call fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And we were getting a lot of patients in our pain clinic who had these um, migrating pains and fatigue and cognitive impairment and a whole host of systemic complaints that just didn't fit any model that we had. Um, the diagnosis was based on touching some specific painful points in the body and enumerating them, which is a really um, inadequate way to make any diagnosis for anything. Um, and at that time, a lot of people thought that it was psychological in origin. Um, but no psychotherapy that anyone tried seemed to do much. So I became convinced it was a physical illness of some kind, um, but there weren't very many answers. So as we worked with patients with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, in the 80s, we had very little answers. In the early 90s, we began to figure out some things. In fact, Dr. Shealy was one of the first to find out some of those. He, he found out that DHEA deficiency was common in most of them. He found out that magnesium deficiency was common in most of them. And from that early start, we began to expand on the list of things that caused chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Um, I began to connect with Jacob Teitelbaum in the mid 90s. Um, and Jacob had discovered more of these. So we began to have a working differential of things that ought to be looked for. Um, uh, adrenal, thyroid, sex hormone deficiencies, um, dental issues, uh, magnesium deficiency, intestinal dysbiosis, uh, food allergy. 
those were really common. We found that if we treated those, a lot of those patients would get completely well. In conventional medicine at the time, they were basically saying, you can't treat it, just live with it. It's a psychological illness. And we were finding that wasn't true at all. By the late 90s, it was clear that quite a few of these patients also had Lyme disease and co-infections of Lyme disease. And by 2005, Richie Shoemaker had added mold toxicity as another major component of what we're looking at. So I basically got into this in that year when Richie published his first major book, Mold Warriors. Um, a patient of mine insisted that I read the book and I read it and I went, this is brilliant. I flew out to see Richie in Pocomoke, Maryland. Um, we've kind of been friends since then. And uh, basically using that model evolved a bigger model. Uh, eventually Richie and I didn't quite agree on many of the aspects of treating mold toxicity. And uh, I've kind of been involved with um, a large group of physicians in helping other physicians to understand what it is and how to treat it. So I, I, my basic practice involves kind of complex medical problem solving, mostly cases that some conventional docs don't know what to do with, pain cases that people don't know what to do with. And as it's evolved, uh, many of these turn out to be Lyme disease and, and mold toxicity, and I'm sure other toxicities that we haven't uncovered yet. Interesting. It's sounding a lot like functional medicine, too. Made connection with well, it, it was functional medicine before it was called that. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So, yeah, it's an area that I'm just beginning to learn about uh, from having had a, a leak in our back second bathroom that uh, flooded the floor and uh, my partner came home from Australia to a mold filled house and I had to tear out all the flooring and uh, it's it's uh, become a, in my face recently because she's very sensitive to it so right it can be a very nasty health issue if not dealt with properly and so much more widespread when you think about buildings and, and leaks and all the opportunities of indoor environments that we provide this wonderful culture medium for them to to grow and uh, poison us. So. Well, it's estimated that there are perhaps 10 million Americans that are wrestling with this to some degree. Yeah. So it's hardly an inconsequential issue, but not, not a lot is really known about it. Um, a lot of uh, medical doctors have never heard of it. Um, and, and so part of my mission is to help our profession and patients know that it exists and know what we know about treating it. Now, is there any kind of uh, grouping or organization of other physicians that are onto this? Or do you uh, get together and exchange notes, have a journal, uh, whatever? Well, boy. There's several organizations that um, have recognized that it's an issue, and most of them you would know as basic um, holistic medical organizations. So, for example, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, um, ACAM. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've not been asked to speak by the AHMA yet. I don't know why, but... Um, that's an organization that hasn't quite embraced it yet. Um, ILADS, which is involved in treating Lyme disease, has begun teaching sections on that. What, um, what I, I ILADS? ILADS, uh, the International Lyme and Associated Disease Organization. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's, a, it's a group that has been pioneering the treatment of Lyme disease for about 25 years now. Oh. Um, my friend Norty Fishman got into that big time in uh, D.C. and uh, another friend has been struggling with it for almost 20 years, so I've been aware of the, the immense uh, the emotional cost of Lyme disease. Wow. Um, no, it's, and huge. So um, there are other organizations that um, have begun to, to deal with it. Um, so I do a lot of lecturing and podcasts. I have a group of 
um, oh, 40 or 50 physicians that I mentor um, by, we have groups of about 10 or 11. We meet every two months for a couple of hours and in a go to meeting format and we'll go over their difficult cases um, mm -hmm. and, and also discuss topics of interest to them so I can share with them what I've learned. Interesting. And you still have a practice as well. I, I still have a practice. I do a lot of consulting work and I do a lot of writing. Um, when, I, when we first started learning about all of these things, um, I wrote a book in 2007 uh, called On Hope and Healing, which was republished uh, as something called Healing is Possible, which sort of is an overview of functional medicine before it was really being called that. Mm -hmm. And then um, two years ago, I wrote a book uh, uh, called Toxic, um, Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, and Other Environmental Toxins, which outlines what we now know about um, all of these toxicities and how to not only to think about them, but how to understand how interconnected they are and how they trigger a number of associated conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm reaching a fair amount of people through writing, teaching. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And uh, of course, writing books is a, a huge project in itself. <laughs> uh, you have time for uh, a life as well still? or I, I still have a, a, a life. Um, I, I spend a great deal of time with my dogs and my wife. Um, I do a lot of hiking and walking in the Mendocino area. Mm -hmm. um, do a bit of traveling when I get a chance. But actually, writing is one of my hobbies. I love writing. Mm -hmm. For me, it's, it's for me, uh, it's not an effort. So um, I write blogs and newsletters and lots of other things. So uh, writing is one of my creative outlets. Well, good. That's it's putting it all together to actually publish a book. That last uh, stretch of getting it to. In one piece, it's like uh, yeah. The, the, the getting the first one done was a big deal. It was like giving birth. But yeah. um, you know, after you've done it once, it's not quite as mm -hmm. it's not quite as difficult. And you have you know what you're doing a little bit better. Your systems are in place. And and in in my career, I went from uh, one publisher to a better publisher to a better publisher, and and I've got a wonderful publisher now that. Uh, love working with um, makes life easy. Who's that? Victory Belt. Uh huh. Well, I'll put links in the uh, narrative to your book, so people. That's fine. I mean, Victory Belt is a lovely company. They they really started out primarily with um, working on diet books, particularly focusing and specializing in uh, in keto diet, paleo diet work but they've expanded to many other medical subjects as we've uh, kind of evolved this. Oh, one of the areas I've been most intrigued with is Bredesen's work in uh, uh, Recode and uh, uh, seeing there's probably some overlap in terms of inflammation and overall, uh, what, uh, what do you see the connections there? And uh, Well, yeah, I mean, I know Dale very well. Um, uh, he's asked me to teach the lime and mold section of his course, which I have. And, and um, Dale is just putting out this month a um, certification video program. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm a part of that. Um, uh, Dale is, Dale's work is wonderful, and I'm happy to uh, participate with him in it. Um, but there's a tremendous overlap in terms of his understanding of inflammation as a major component to Alzheimer's and our working with all of these other sources of inflammation. So they, they dovetail very nicely. Yeah, he talks about, I think it's type three, our toxic right. uh, sources. He doesn't particularly mention uh, molds, but um, I just realized. Uh, uh, actually, he does often. I, I was watching an older interview before his book came out. That uh, uh, well, it's a, it's actually in his book, and in his more recent information, the more he's actually studied it and looked for it, he is finding mold toxicity as one of the main players 
yeah. in what in what gets people Alzheimer's and it's treatable. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is fascinating. Wow. Well, we've covered uh, quite the waterfront. Uh, are there any areas I've missed of uh, your unusual life? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it didn't seem like an unusual life. It kind of flowed from oh, that's... one thing to the next of, well, an opportunity would just show up of something I wanted to learn. And so everything that I did um, kind of fell in my lap. Someone would, would go, oh, you have a background in this and you have an interest in this. Uh, do you want to do this? Or do you want to learn this? And I go, sure, teach me. You're in the flow. Uh, well, I was. <laughs> At this point in my life, um, I think I'm more in the teaching people what I know and what I've learned category. Yeah. Um, it's not that I don't welcome the opportunity to learn new things, but um, at a certain point, you go from being a student, and I've always thought of myself as the perennial student, and at a certain point, someone says, um, you're no longer a student, kiddo, you're now an elder, you know, you're going to have to step up to the plate and and have a different relationship with what you think you know and what you've learned. So it's changed. And given that, uh, and our viewers may not realize this, but we're in the uh, uh, middle or hopefully end of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I'm <clears throat> curious, we're not wearing masks, obviously, because we're far away. But uh, any thoughts on, on that and where, uh, uh, where we're going as a culture? Oh boy, I have some real fears about that across the board. Um, and and I, what I'm about to say may not be popular, but um, I don't feel like we've handled the COVID epidemic well at all. Amen. And when it first came out, I viewed it as just another flu. And I felt that we were wrong in trying to isolate the entire world. Mm -hmm. It was being based on some statistical models that a few people were tossing about, but it still felt wrong. I'm a great believer in the natural world and that uh, one doesn't fight with mother nature. Sounds like so, Zach Bush. I, I don't necessarily want to be compared to other people, but it's epidemics and flus have a natural flow to them and you don't fight them. Yeah. yeah exactly. So um, I appreciate that the intent was to spare people getting sick and dying when they didn't feel that they had enough resources to really deal with it. But the consequences of our decisions have been catastrophic. Yeah. We, we have, in, in, in viewing this purely from the lens of health, and this might sound strange, coming from a human being, I have devoted my life to health. However, health has to be seen in a greater context. Mm -hmm. And the greater context is the health of our economy, the health of people being able to earn a living and take care of their families and, and interact with each other in meaningful ways, um, not with masks on. So I, I really feel we handled it badly. Had we allowed it to come through us, we would long be done with it. Our economy would not be crippled. And I deeply regret that, yes, some more people might have died. But all we've done is prolong the agony, prolong this. And again, this may not be a popular opinion. I, I just um, have grave concerns about what we've done. Um, we, we know, for example, that the, the CDC has announced that there are more deaths from suicide in yeah. this period of time than there are from COVID itself. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, and no one talks about that. No one's talking about it. No one's talking yeah. about divorce, abuse, yeah. the racial turmoil that our country is currently embroiled in. And uh, so- And the evictions and uh, foreclosures and the failed businesses and the billionaires uh, breaking it in. Uh, so it, it's a travesty. 
Mm -hmm. And I believe we've handled it very badly. And I, as a physician who really cares about human beings, I really wish we would take a different stance, if you will, rip off the Band-Aid, get this over with so we can all get our lives back. Um, to whatever extent we can, we've already made, we've already crippled our economy. I, I don't think we can recover it just by getting over it. No. Um, so since you, since you asked. Mm -hmm. Well, we're on the same wavelength on that. It's been my major focus for the last six months of just looking at, and, and the idea of a, a vaccine is suddenly going to make everything go back to normal when 20 years of failure with coronavirus vaccines. It's, um, no, I, I think that's a silly idea that's being tossed out to the public to help them think that we have something on the horizon mm -hmm. that's going to fix this in a simple way. Um, uh, that we will be able to develop vaccine is questionable. Um, that it will be safe is Even questionable. <laughs> is questionable. Yeah. So I, this is not the way. I, I, so I, I so uh, interesting that we agree. What, uh, why I mentioned Zach Bush is that his, I just watched his two hour webinar on, uh, on the virome and I've been hearing interviews with him and getting that, you know, terrain theory versus germ theory. And I'd heard about that in med school. One of our professors first year said, you know, the famous Pasteur deathbed quote, but of course it was lip service and all of my training experience and I, you know, I live in a, germ theory world, but I'm finally getting what uh, Bush is trying to say about how viruses are an integral part of everything. And uh, they're by and large not pathogenic. In this case, it it's causes clumping. It's the pollution from uh, air pollution and glyphosate and EMFs. And you know, the, it's, it's, the wrong thing is being blamed. So, well, uh, and you know, and that's the message of my last book, which is, it begs the question of why are we seeing an epidemic of these illnesses that I've named, yeah. chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia yeah. and Lyme disease and mold and autism and neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's included. Why is it epidemic now? It, yeah. was, it wasn't before. And almost everyone who is working in this field believes as I do, that it's because of the toxicity of the world we live in. Yeah, yeah. Um, that um, that's the issue, and we're running out of time if we have not already yeah. to deal to deal with that issue. Well, we're on the same wavelength there. Well, to wrap up, are there any other uh, um, more positive notes we could? <laughs> well, sure. I, I'm an optimist, actually. Good. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure I should be these days, but I, I'm. <laughs> I'm, I'm an incurable optimist, and all of the books that I've written, and my message is always, these illnesses currently are treatable. We know how to treat it. So what's really important is to get them diagnosed properly, because we do have treatments. So that people who've been suffering, sometimes for years, with difficult illnesses, if you will seek out the right information and the right person with the right training, it is very possible that you can still get, get well. Mm -hmm. And I, so my message is hope, which is learn more, get the, right, get the right assistance, and I believe that you can get well. Well, great closing words. Uh... Thank you for taking this time with me and sharing yourself for, we hope, generations long after us and uh, uh, being a pioneer in this important area. So I'm gonna end the recording now.